Okay, so good afternoon, folks, and welcome back to another episode of the Hilltop Workshop. Today on the bench, I have a variety of bits and pieces um, that I want to use to kind of demonstrate and hopefully explain and clear up something that I've seen a fair bit of confusion about on the internet recently. Um, mainly because I've been looking for the confusion's been there for a while, but um, I've only discovered it recently. And so I want to try and uh, put my bit forward and explain to you uh, why um, some of these things are, are getting miscommunicated and, and misunderstood. And um, there's a bit of uh, misinformation, I guess, is getting passed around. So topic for the day is primarily vacuum advance. Um, and the correct signal that's supposed to go to your distributor for vacuum advance on a petrol engine. Um, now, before I get too far into it, I think for a bit of a basis, uh, just to form a bit of a basis, I'd like to describe the three different types of vacuum signal that you will encounter on a carburetor or, uh, or a petrol engine, but, uh, fuel injected or whatever, um, and what they do and what their purposes are. So I'm uh, going to start with this one. Uh, now, I, I hope you appreciate I stayed up for hours drawing these diagrams. I um, used to be a graphic designer, so that's shining through hopefully here. A manifold vacuum. Manifold vacuum is the most essential vacuum signal an engine can have. Without manifold vacuum, it quite simply won't run. Well, it won't idle. Um, Obviously, we can get into turbochargers, boost and supercharge and that sort of thing, but that's a video for another another uh, another day. I'm talking about just a normal, naturally aspirated engine, um, standard sort of engine. So, yeah. Now, manifold vacuum is generated by the low pressure area that is created when a cylinder has a piston travel down at its speed and the inlet valve is open and that piston going down the cylinder creates a low pressure area in the cylinder and thus when the valve is opened the inlet manifold all the way up to the throttle valve which we're going to assume for all intents and purposes for this demonstration is closed so we're talking about an engine at idle or at least at a part throttle application so you know if a, if a vehicle is operating at wide open throttle under high load you know you, your manifold vacuum is going to go right right down um, you know normally to about two inches of mercury inch and a half of mercury um, some of the elite tuners um, can spend a lot of time and manage to get that wide open throttle vacuum down to as near as half an inch of mercury. Um, that takes a lot of time, a lot of dedication, but it can be done and the results are spectacular. Um, but we're just talking again about a relatively standard engine here. So at idle for a normal engine, manifold vacuum is going to be sitting around anywhere between 17 and 21 inches of uh, mercury. And obviously, yeah, under uh, when throttles applied under load, that manifold vacuum is going to drop. And then uh, inversely, uh, when you're decelerating, if you're coasting down a hill and you back off the accelerator and the engine's still operating a reasonably high or relatively high RPM um, and your engine braking effectively, um, that manifold vacuum is going to rise, uh, you know, to the realms of the sort of mid-20s, you know, inches of mercury, sometimes a little higher. You're not going to get any higher than, you know, a perfect vacuum. You're not going to reach that, but... Um, that vacuum is, uh, that low pressure is what's basically slowing you down in an engine that, uh, that's in good condition and valve clearances are correct, etc. And uh, you're, you're basically decelerating down a hill. You're using that manifold vacuum to effectively slow the car uh, when you're not braking. So manifold vacuum is found anywhere below the throttle valve uh, during normal running operation. And it can be used for powering such devices as your power assisted brakes so yeah, brake boosters and whatnot run off manifold vacuum uh, likewise uh, air conditioning vents you know, vehicle ventilation systems the mechanics of air conditioning vents etc in your vehicle a lot of the time are run on a manifold vacuum that's stored in a vacuum uh, chamber of some description in a vacuum canister uh, your some some earlier vehicles actually had windscreen wipers that were run on on manifold vacuum as well on vacuum uh, on a vacuum reserve so manifold vacuum is actually a really good and effective and efficient um, source of power when it can be used properly um, so that's a basic rundown of manifold vacuum so at idle you've got about 17 to 21 inches of mercury in uh, manifold vacuum obviously it goes down when you accelerate 
and increases when you decelerate at speed. So, manifold vacuum, the most important vacuum signal to an engine. Now, Venturi vacuum. Venturi vacuum is, don't, don't pay too much attention to this one because it's not something that the average tuner or, or car fanatic has to deal with that often. Uh, Venturi vacuum is mainly reserved for carburetors with vacuum secondaries, such as this one here. This is off a Mitsubishi L300. And Venturi vacuum is generated by high airflow through the Venturi above the throttle valve. So if you look down the Venturi of a carburetor that uses Venturi vacuum for its vacuum secondaries, normally around the narrowest part of the Venturi, you will find a small orifice. Now, my lighting and setup in here is not really good enough to demonstrate this, um, but I'll try and point out at least where you might find it. So what will happen is you go wide open throttle on the primary. The secondaries will get a little bit of a kick normally by the um, by the by the linkages and then as the secondaries open yeah we're not going to be able to see that but down in that secondary venturi just below where the choke and the auxiliary venturi are there you'll see a small orifice on one side of it and that basically hooks up to the vacuum secondary diaphragm and as that airflow travels through there it creates a low pressure area there and draws air through the passage, through the gallery that is attached to this vacuum secondary diaphragm and then applies low pressure to here, which then of course pulls our linkage on and draws the secondary open even more. So it's got a bit of a feedback loop in there in the sense that the more air flowing through here at a higher speed that we get, the more of a low pressure it generates past that orifice in here, where our vacuum advance, uh, sorry, where our vacuum secondary diaphragm is connected to, which even, which then pulls the secondary on with an even stronger signal again. So, uh, while you're accelerating, as the engine RPM are increasing, the airflow is increasing. That signal is getting stronger, which pulls the secondaries on faster and faster. These things, of course, are regulated by different things. And in, in this this carburetor here, there is a bit of a restriction. On, uh, on that vacuum fitting there. Some carburetors have that restriction built into them. Um, you know, you, you, your dime a dozen hollies, your 600 vac sec, uh, hollies, um, they have a little ball bearing in the vacuum secondary diaphragm, which needs to be there. If you take that out, the secondaries come on too fast and you end up, with a, you end up falling into a big hole. Um, so that, that little ball bearing in the vacuum secondary diaphragm of a holly carburetor needs to be there. It's part of the design. The Holly carburetor is a good place to find that orifice. If you have a look at the uh, secondary venturi that's closest to the secondary diaphragm, you'll find just below the choke, behind below the narrowest part of the venturi, you'll see that there is a small orifice there. And it is actually adjoined uh, to a similar orifice in the primary, where it gets its initial vacuum charge from. And then, uh, yeah, as the airflow increases, the, both of those orifices um, are used to create the vacuum signal to the vacuum secondary diaphragm and then pulls the secondary on. But again, like I said, don't put too much weight and thought into Venturi vacuum. It's not something that your normal tuner has to worry about. Um, if your carburetor is in good working order and all of the galleries and orifices and whatnot are, are clear and operating as they should, um, that's not something that nearly it really needs to be addressed now this one here is the one that is causing all of the confusion ported vacuum now what is ported vacuum ported vacuum is generated by airflow at part throttle or just off idle and part throttle applications where the air is going past the throttle butterfly we're at a part throttle application and in the side of the base adjacent to the throttle disc you'll find a series of orifices that are strategically positioned in a manner that when the throttle disc is just cracked or partly open the air going past those orifices will have a similar effect to what we described with the venturi vacuum in that the air flowing past there will be going pretty fast 
and that airflow going past there is going to create a low pressure area there which is going to create a vacuum signal to those orifices and the galleries that they're con connected to. So I'm going to try and point this out on this carburetor. I'll try and zoom in here and see if I can get this thing to focus. Right, so hopefully you can see um, this reasonably well. Now this is the primary throttle uh, disc here, primary venturi here with the throttle disc, secondary over here which is obviously closed. And the choke is set on this carburetor, so that's why it's open where it is at the moment. It's a wax pallet choke, so um, it's not that easy to wind off. So I'm just going to leave it where it is now. And well, between the carburetor base and the throttle disc, you can see that series of uh, little orifices that I was talking about. And each of those is placed in a location that gives a particular vacuum signal at a particular opening of the throttle disc. Now that's all decided by the manufacturer of the carburetor, they're the ones that put the brain work into it. But that is where ported vacuum is generated. And ported vacuum is the signal that you want to have going to your vacuum advance. In 99.9999 to the end of earth, end of the earth, cases out of 100, ported vacuum is what needs to go to a vacuum advance diaphragm. Now let me explain why. So, if we try and mimic that, at idle, on a normal engine, you will have zero ported vacuum. If, the carbur if your throttle valves are set up the way they're supposed to be at idle, they should be almost closed, and there should be no vacuum signal being generated out of the ported vacuum ports. When you crack the throttle, slightly, that's what happens. A little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. The more that throttle valve opens to a point of course the more air rushes past those throttle discs and those orifices at speed creating a low pressure signal to these fittings and henceforth to the vacuum advance diaphragm on your distributor that is the signal that you want because as you accelerate you want that timing to go poof, up a little bit not the opposite and if your distributor is connected to manifold vacuum as we've described before as soon as you accelerate that vacuum drops and so does your advance so hooking your advance your vacuum advance up to manifold vacuum is the exact opposite of what vacuum advance is intended to do so vacuum advance gets connected to ported vacuum there are exceptions to this Toyotas, I believe some Nissans and also I think some uh, maybe some Hondas. A lot of Japanese cars have dual capsule vacuum advances on them, dual diaphragm vacuum advance capsules. They actually run manifold vacuum to the vacuum advance at idle and then once that manifold vacuum drops down the ported vacuum takes over and it kind of it reaches an equilibrium then the ported vacuum takes over. So um, that's that's a video for another day, that's, that's a topic for another video. Um, what we're talking about here is just basic vacuum advance on say you know your small block Chevys or your you know your, a basic carburetted petrol engine so to reiterate and this is where the confusion arrives manifold vacuum does not go to vacuum advance doing so does the exact opposite of what vacuum advance is described to do so at cruise at a right cruise your carburetor is designed so that at cruise it's going to be generating the right ported vacuum signal to be able to give the best vacuum advance that it possibly can. The right distributor with the right carburetor at the right place is going to work just as the manufacturer intended. If you hook your vacuum advance distributor up to manifold vacuum, it's going to be the complete opposite. You're going to get full advance, full vacuum advance at idle, which is not what you want. And then as soon as you crack that throttle, the ignition timing is going to retard by 10, 15 degrees, whatever the vacuum advance capsule is designed to add and do the exact opposite of what it was designed to do. So I just want to say, and I just want to get this message clear, that um, it, you know, I, I don't understand why this misunderstanding is there, but this is how it's supposed to be. The overwhelming majority of motor vehicles with vacuum advance are designed to have the vacuum advance hooked up to ported vacuum. Manifold vacuum 
it's completely counterintuitive and they work almost as polar opposites so in tying up manifold vacuum does not get connected to your vacuum advance the vacuum advance goes to ported vacuum and ported vacuum ports can be found pretty easily on most carburetors on hollies it's normally out of the side of the metering block on uh, Rochester Quadrajets, it's normally out of the front of the main body. Now, carburetors like this, you can see here, this uh, vacuum fitting here actually goes to the, uh, sorry, this vacuum fitting here goes to manifold vacuum. This one here is your actual, is your ported vacuum, and that's the one that the vacuum advance gets connected up to. So, take that away. I'm interested in hearing feedback on these, but I'll be very, very keen to hear if anybody has a solid argument against what we've discussed here today so i hope that's given you something to work with i hope it's made sense i've tried to cover it as briefly but as concisely as i possibly can i didn't i didn't want this to be a super long video but i wanted to cover the background of all the different vacuum signals how they're generated and why they do what they do and why they're not supposed to do what a lot of people are making them do questions comments additions please leave them down below if I can respond to anything or anybody wants to open up a dialogue, I'm more than happy to. And until next time, I hope you stay well and I hope you're all keeping uh, relatively safe and healthy throughout these uh, interesting times that we're in at the moment. Anyway, take care. I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers. Thanks for watching.